question that, that I want to ask you is, uh, how have the Psalms impacted and or enriched your walk with Jesus in your life? I would like to kind of take some time after the devotion time to just sort of share a little bit about how the Psalms have impacted your life and how they've enriched your walk with Jesus. I want you to share so that I can uh, ridicule you because you read the Psalms wrong and, you know, and uh, that, that I can have a chance to chastise you because of your poor use of scripture, right? That's what I'm, that's why I'm asking you, right? Of course it's not. Of course it's not. But those, those messages run through our heads. We, we, we behave as if there's, there's somehow, you know, a gotcha when we share about Jesus. And if you share the wrong thing, we're just going to jump all over you. And I can tell you that's not true unless you're a pastor. And then that's absolutely true. So, so yeah. So, you know, I, I would really like for you to think about it. And as I'm sharing, you can kind of noodle on that a little bit. And then at the end of the devotion time, I'd like to share a little with one another about how the Psalms have impacted you. Get it? Good. Okay, let's pray before we begin. Father God, I pray and ask for your guidance. I pray that your Holy Spirit would open our minds as we discuss this most impactful and important section of Scripture. We want to say thank you for giving us the Psalms, for how they have enriched and blessed our lives as we read the pages of the, song, the books of Psalms, how normal we feel when we read them. I ask for your guidance by your Holy Spirit to open our understanding of the chapter tonight and that we would be better stewards of reading and understanding, interpreting, uh, the, and applying the book of Psalms. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Okay, so let me talk, uh, talk a little bit about Psalm 1 as a way to sort of help us understand the place of Psalms in the life of a New Testament Christian, okay? So, some of you may, like me, have, have uh, memorized Psalm 1. Uh, mine was um, from Jeff Hansen. He, he challenged me to... to uh, in, Commit to memory several of the Psalms along with other passages of Scripture. Uh, this is going to be a new, new Living Translation, although I memorized it in NIV. So, you know, depending on your age and uh, entry into the faith, it may be KJV that you know it in, or, or um, the modern English version, or something like that. But the New Living Translation says this about Psalm, interprets or, or translates Psalm 1. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank bearing fruit each season. Their leaves <clears throat> never wither, and they prosper in all they do, but not the wicked. They're like worthless chaff scattered by the wind. They will be condemned at the time of judgment. Sinners will have no place among the godly, for the Lord watches over the path of the godly, but the path of the wicked leads to destruction. So the psalm, I read it in its entirety because that's the way the psalms should be read, correct? They're units. They're made as a unit. They're written to be read or understood or heard, more likely is the best way to say it. They're, they're made, they're written to be heard in their entirety, even Psalm 119. Wow. Yeah. 22 stanzas of 8 verses each. Do that math, because mathing is hard. I don't know. That's a lot of verses. But uh, they were meant to be as, uh, spoken of as a whole. Psalm 1 is typically thought of as almost a theme of the book of Psalms. It's put there to lead you into the book of Psalms. It's intentionally Psalm 1. 
it's the first psalm that you encounter going way back into antiquity, meaning hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Psalm 1 was put there to help you understand this entire book known as the Psalms. And it starts out by saying what not to do. Isn't that strange? It, it starts with, you know, if you were in another translation, blessed are those blessed. Your life will go better for you if you do not. And then it's, it's talking about walking, standing, and sitting. Right? And when it's often thought to, you know, that there might be a progressiveness to that walk, stand, sit. If we read the book of Psalms chapter that we read, we would want to be careful about that, wouldn't we? We want to be careful about that because we know that the, that the psalmist here who wrote this first psalm is absolutely just trying to, to relate to us an idea. And that is that you should avoid all environments that have evil associated with them. Or foolishness because of, of someone that you know doesn't follow God. In this case, the Old Testament, it would be a follower of Yahweh, though you would say Jehovah. And so the psalmist is saying, if you avoid these settings, you'll find yourself in a positive place. And then it goes into some specifics about those things that happen to you when you do that. And why, you, when you're avoiding, it's, it's, it's what you should not do. And then it goes into what happens in someone's life who does avoid evil places and evil people or less than godly, let's put it that way, if you want to be politically correct in scripture. They delight, delight in the law of the Lord. And there's this idea that, that the word is such a part of their lives, they've imbibed it. You know, they've, they've drunk deeply at, at the feet of the living water. They have taken in the truths of God. <coughs> Their delight is on the law of the Lord, and on it, a, a godly person meditates on it all the time. Now, we can't mean that you read your Bible. It can't mean that, could it? It can't mean that you read your Bible, because nobody had a Bible when this was written. So what could it mean? How do you meditate on the law of the Lord day and night if you don't have a Bible that you carry around? Yeah. You've memorized it. You've heard it in, 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 in uh, the temple read. You've, you've made it your part into your heart. You've, you've been integrated it into your life to the point where you know what the Ten Commandments say. You know what the law of the Lord is. You delight in it because you meditate on it constantly. You've committed it to memory. So that's another thing. You know, don't make the scriptures say something that it couldn't have meant. So, I mean, that means that you and I can, we have how incredibly privileged we are to have a copy of Scripture in our hands. And it's going to be easier for us to meditate on it, because it's at, at the ready. We can open our electronic devices and have it. And, and that there's the meditation, you, you've integrated it to your, to your life so much that Scripture and things that relate to Scripture pop up all around you. Everything reminds you of God's word. Okay? Much like when you buy a new car and you think, wow, what a cool car, and then you see that car everywhere you turn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> True. So you find yourself integrating God's word to the point where you see it pop up everywhere in your life. Well, that reminds me of Psalm 1. And what that leads to, when you, when you have a life that avoids evil and embraces good, your life a tree who's planted by the streams of living water, if you will, and you're, you're able to yield a fruit no matter what the weather is like because you have this stream of provision of life-giving water because you've planted yourself in a place. There's imagery here. You've planted yourself close to the living God 
and your roots are deeply embedded in him, and you're drawing from him. There's imagery here. Do you see it? And, and if, if everything around you is <clears throat> whirling out of control, your roots are deep in the Lord, and you're nourishing yourself from the Lord, and you are not swayed by circumstance. There's imagery here, and that's somebody who is meditating on God's word day and night. And then they prosper in all they do. In all they do? Could it have meant that if you bet on a lottery, that your lottery ticket wins every time? Is that what that passage means? Might it have been tied toward the final judgment that when you set yourself up for success according to the Lord, when it's time to stand before the Lord in judgment, you pass. Because the Lord's going to look at you as we are New Testament Christians, and he's going to say, well done, I see my son in you. Although, follow God's ways, and you are like that tree planted by the water. The things that happen to you in this life are temporary. And you've been given this eternal mindset that gives you a, a, a tremendous ability to endure <coughs> no matter what comes. And then the contrast, not so the wicked. They are like worthless chaff scattered by the wind. The stuff when you pull wheat together, you throw it up in the air on the threshing floor, and the winds blow and take the unwanted stuff away, and what falls are the kernels. And the good stuff is left, and the chaff is blown away. That is an image of how God sees the wicked. When the judgment comes, gone. You cannot stand in judgment. In fact, doesn't it say that? They will be condemned. They will not stand, some translations say, at the time of judgment. Sinners will have no place among the godly. But the path, the Lord watches over the path of the godly, but the path of the wicked leads to destruction. It's good stuff. It actually sets us up to understand how to handle the Psalms. Mm -hmm. The Psalms <coughs> are there for when the difficulties come. The Psalms will help you be like a plant, a planted tree by the streams of living water. They're there to help you when the difficult times come, so that the Lord may produce a fruit in you. Because you know what a fruit tree doesn't have to try and do? It doesn't have to try and produce fruit. You know why it produces fruit? Because it's a fruit tree. Mm -hmm. You know what a child of God does by nature of how you've been made? Produce. Amen. Produce fruit. And when circumstances come into our lives, God gives us the Psalms to help us endure. Not escape, endure. It's a different E word. And that is the message over and over and over again in Scripture. The people ask for an escape. They ask for rescue. What the Lord provides is a way to endure and bear up underneath the painful trial. In fact, doesn't the New Testament tell us to consider it pure joy when you face when, not if, it's not conditional, when. it's when you face trials of many kinds. I think that passage is that in 1 Peter or is that in James? I always mix those two up. It, I, I always do that in my brain. I think it's James, isn't it? Yeah. And I think it has to, James has to be writing here thinking about what the Psalms can do in your life. So now I want to ask you, what has the Psalms done? How has it benefited you? How has it impacted your life? Time to share. We're going first. <laughs> Nobody likes to go first. Who wants to go second? I go last. <laughs> Who wants to go second? <laughs> second. Okay. I went first. Ha, ha, ha. That's the trick. Okay. When my daughter was in uh, second grade, I think it was, Christian school.
school in our church. And that was a DACE program, and we were required to memorize scripture. It was to be scriptures in each subject, but then you <coughs> one large one for the month. And it was they do it in sections depending on the month you had to have it. Psalm 91 was the first one. It was the first that I started loving the word of God, and it was the first that I had ever memorized because I was teaching it to her. And I was like, wow, I'm reading it. Karen, did you hear that? Yeah. It was just thrilling. Amazing. It was just thrilling. Yes. Amen. Somebody else. Okay. Yeah. Psalms 101 was the first time that I actually loved with my whole heart. It, it just, it spoke to me right where I was. And it dealt with, it, I was able to apply that to issues in my life at that time. It's, it's, it's like God was just saying, this will help you. This will heal you. This will challenge you. This is exactly what you need to deal with this stuff that's been whipping your butt for so long. Amen. Okay, now that was that. Okay, the next one I asked that really got me. I mean, that really got me. That it was like being in a parade or something, and a, a, a game, and someone scored a touchdown, and everybody jumped up and started clapping for Psalms 119. I, I mean, I said, I, I read that several times, and it just, it just kept talking about the decrees and the laws of God and the statutes. And I started looking up these words because I wanted to know exactly what they meant yeah. back then. Yeah. And it was, it, I got it. I got it. I got it. It was like God was saying, I want to teach you something. And I'm going to open up your mind so that you can truly understand it. And Psalms 119 is, as we know, really long, but it is so beautiful and oh, awesome. It's gorgeous. Time. Oh, yeah. It's high, it's high poetry. Absolutely. Who else had their hand up or something? I did. Yes. <clears throat> uh, there's a whole bunch of different Psalms, but um, the only thing that, when I, the first Psalm that I've memorized, my grandmother taught me when I was like six. And so I had a, gotten a scrapbook from a great aunt that had a dinner. And so she taught me that. And when I'm under stress or when I can't think, because there's sometimes when things come and I need to calm down. There was, a, there was a place when I was like in my 40s and I would have anxiety. And so the only thing I could think of was to say that song. So it always was there to comfort me because it was the only thing I could think of, but there was a place during anxiety time that when I get to, and I learned it in King James, yea, though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, then I would just start to panic all over again, and I'd have to start it all over. But it's been a comforting thing to me, and having learned it at a young age, it's one that really sticks. Yes. Amen. Yes. So, how about... Can, can I ask a, a more specific way? What are what is one word when you think about its impact? Because I've heard some words shared here about what what reading the Psalms has done for you. What's one word you would use to describe how the Psalms have impacted your faith in Jesus? <coughs> so I've heard comfort. <coughs> I heard excitement. Sleep. Sleep? Yeah. It puts you to sleep? No, not put me to sleep, but helps me sleep at night. Okay. Psalm 91. It quiets your, it's, a, it's quieting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I use two words? Led sure. Me. Led me. It led me. It's, it's guidance. It's guidance. Company. Company. I'm not alone. The companionship. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can identify as yeah. opposed to gone before. Yeah. I would say, I would say hope. Reassurance, hope. Same thing right there. Reassurance and hope. You can do, if there's a certain amount of instruction. Okay. Of what you should do. Yeah. They're, they're typically, the Psalms are typically the most reported, reportedly read past a section of scripture of all time. 
You ask anybody on average people on the street what's a, a book in the Bible you've read, Psalms continually always outpaces just about everything else in Scripture. Mm -hmm. I think because of their timelessness, right? And we have to be careful, like Proverbs, <coughs> Proverbs aren't promises. We're going to talk about that next time. Wisdom literature comes up next time. But there's a lot of wisdom in Psalms as well, right? Mm -hmm. So if you can, you know, I, <coughs> one of the sections in our scripture, one of the warnings was, you know, hey, look out, this is not, you know, this isn't a health and wealth gospel. If you, if you follow all this, your, your life's going to go great. And, and uh, you know, you're, you're going to have a, a, a slim waistline and your, your wife will never age and your kids are never going to disobey and your car's never going to break down and your bank account's never going to get below $2 million, <laughs> all of that stuff. That's not what it's saying. It's interesting because one of the things for me personally, when we hit the imprecatory psalms, it's, it talked me off a ledge. It has de-escalated me in my anger. Mm -hmm. Because one of, the, one of the most impacting things that our chapter said, the entire, if I, if I would say what's your one thing you took away from the chapter that was really the thing you're going to take away, is that it normalizes my Christian experience. Mm -hmm. It normalizes what I'm experiencing. It, it runs the gambit of emotion, right? It goes, it goes from joys to deep and utter despair, edging on despair sorrow. But it doesn't ultimately dwell in despair. But it allows you and I to express words of despair when we feel despairing, but we don't want to stay there. It gives us language for when we are excited and joyful in the Lord, when we are filled with anxiety, when we have deep-seated anger and resentment, when we are, we are fearful. All of these emotions that are, that are brought out. I'm, this is, by the way, not original to me. That is, these are, um, this is language right out of How to Read the Psalms by Tripper Long, and I held this one up last week. Uh, he goes through and gives you sort of some of the emotive words, the emotion words that are in there. You know why? Because it's, because of, well, this is, first thing we're introduced in the chapter, we're reminded that the Psalms are poetry. Right, Kay Douglas? Yes. They're poetry. They're written in a way to elicit something within you. And something that, that really is sort of between the lines, which um, it kind of, uh, it, it, we're introduced to emotion here, but then it's sort of all through the chapter, kind of in between the lines. And I want to point right at it. There is a side of us that thinks that emotions are bad, <laughs> or some of us overemphasize emotions. When you read through the Psalms, you know what it does? It teaches you that emotions are, is absolutely one of the train cars in your life. It is not, it is undeniable. It, your emotions ought to be a part of the various cars that make up your psyche and who you are. Without emotion, you're not fully who you are. It creates equilibrium. Yeah. And how we interact with emotions, we need to find an equilibrium. We need to find a, a, a middle ground. But oftentimes, and this is for me, I, I've come up with this imagery, where we want to live is what we wave at when we go by. Mm -hmm. And we're on a pendulum. And we swing from one side to the other. We're, we're, we're absolutely emotionless because we're overwhelmed. We can't feel any of our emotions. <coughs> we wave at that when we swing back the other way. And then, then we're overwhelmed by our emotions and run by them when we're way over here. And then we come off of that precipice and we go, oh, I wanna be right there, I wanna see what's out here. You know, and we go by it. But within the Psalms is revealed, why is it poetry? Because it's, it, the, the Lord wants to elicit deep felt things within you. He wants, he wants the words to emote. Isn't that the right word? He wants to develop 
emotional responses within you in a way that's good. I, I thought maybe I would um, read a section of how to read the Psalms, if I could, on this subject. I'm reading from Trevor Longman's How to Read the Psalms, page 81. The Psalms put us in touch with our deepest emotions. As readers of the Psalms, we can feel ourselves understood and explained by them. Isn't that good language? Mm -hmm. We feel understood and explained by the Psalms. They also make us sensitive to the emotional struggles of others. The Psalms teach us that our emotions are grounded in our faith, our covenant faith. This contradicts our mistaken belief that emotions are something over which we have no control. Did you hear that? Should I read that again? I can't help it. You hear people say, I can't help it. This contradicts our mistaken belief that emotions are something over which we have no control. I'm just a slave to what I feel. Contrary to this, notice how in the Psalms, the composer's feelings are associated with his relationship to God. Oh, it's so good. When God is distant, the psalmist is sad, afraid, ashamed, doubtful, even angry. When God is near, he is happy and secure. He even expresses his love. It is simply not true that our emotional life is something over which we have no control. The psalms can help us to discipline our emotions. This does not mean that we should repress our emotions, far from it. If we follow the example of the psalmist, the psalms are an honest expression of emotions. We get a privileged insight into the negative feelings of the psalmist to which we all can relate. In the psalms, however, the negative always leads to the positive. Doubt leads to trust, anger toward God turns to love, sadness to joy. But we must remember that the psalms aren't magical incantations. It sometimes appears that the psalmist changed his negative feelings to positive ones in a brief moment. But that isn't how it happened. The psalms compress time in such a way that what a long process appears as almost a sudden insight. Honest, honest emotional struggle stands behind the psalm. Why am I spending all this time on talking about our emotions? We need them. Because nobody coaches about emotions in our society. Nobody talks about them in a way that teaches us how to do that. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of good writing on emotion coaching, but it's not heated by our society, yes. I had a question, because on the bottom of 228, he talks about how the Psalms um, exaggerate um, okay. in pregatory Psalms, harness our anger and help us express it by using the same sorts of obvious purposeful exaggeration known to us from other types of Psalms. And Hyperbole. Right. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Do you agree with the Psalms overstate emotions? I think it uses hyperbole, yeah. yeah. I think, yes, I think the Psalms are using hyperbole in ways, and it, the, the, the difference is, is that anger is expressed to God, not to someone else. It's not, a, it's not turned towards someone else either. So then, When I'm what? super frustrated, they say, they use language that tries to emote that. So then when David is talking about how he feels about, you know, being pursued for his life and all that, yeah, that's hyperbole? I think, I think what we yeah. have there is a very small section that's trying to describe a whole big um, section of David's life. So yeah, it's, it's, it's condensed and it's intense. I don't, I don't think that it's... So you don't think David felt those intense feelings? Well, I think he did, but I think he's, he's, he's using it verbally at times to try and express just how great of a feeling it is. So you, you, you can kind but of... maybe it was that great of a feeling. 
but he's doing it in, in a very short amount of time is what I'm saying. Like you have it in like two or three lines when it's over a year, year and a half of his, his life that he's trying to express in this one little moment. So it's, it's over the top language because he's talking about this very intense time of his life. Right, but how do we know he didn't feel that that strong? <clears throat> I don't think I'm saying that he did. I think I think when I hear the word hyperbole, which I always think it's like um, over the top, you know, being uh, I can't think of the word, but you're you're saying it way too much, and yeah. so it's almost like BS because yeah. it's, it's yeah, that's not that's true. Western hyperbole. This okay. is Hebrew poetry. But this is, but I think, <laughs> I think that's word. what she's kind of saying. Yeah. Is, yeah. Are you yeah. saying that the Psalms and some of the stuff is just actually BS? Because no. No. And, and you keep saying no, but so I think what they're, in my opinion, the word hyperbole is not a good one to use in this regard because I think you can just say he's using a lot of emotional words and a lot of word pictures to try to get right. you to understand just how distraught he is or whatever the right. emotion is. Right, I but don't the think, author even, oh, sorry. I don't think that hyperbole is a good word to use because it yeah. has that connotation. Well, who's the author? Who is he writing to? He is writing to Americans, so he should use words that we would understand. Well, no, he also uses is, the word exaggeration. <laughs> hyperbole is is a is a um, is a proper term because if you, let's say you take a three year section of David's <laughs> life, and that section that he's talking about is taking a slice of his life, and it's a, of the range of emotions. Let's say it's a sine curve. He's talking about this section right here. And he's, he's slicing that. There are a lot of other things he was feeling during that time. And it's, it's exaggeration in that it's like his entire life wasn't spanned by that. But he's talking about a specific segment of his experience and how he felt about that. Does that make sense? Why does so, that matter? I mean, it's, it's, he's still saying it's an exaggeration. Whether it's a span of his life or a moment of his life, I don't know why that matters. I'm not doing a great job of it. Yeah, so if you have a sine curve, right, and I feel really I'm a high anxiety, high, high intensity, and then it comes down like this. And you're, you're, you're laying down, and it's like, wow, I'm just mellow. And then I've got high anxiety. He's just talking about this whole section right here. Well, I think we know that. Right, we know yeah. that, but the author says that's an exaggeration. But that's an exaggeration. In other of this words, he didn't really saying. feel because that. Because he had he had some of these experiences too, but it's an exaggeration because all you're seeing is this right here. He's overemphasizing one part of his life to get a point across because there are high points in your life that are very difficult, and it's okay to express those. And I don't think exaggeration is probably the right word. I think no. hyperbole is. Well, I don't think either one of them. Um, because <laughs> if you're if you're exaggerating something, then you're it's it comes back to BS again. It, it's it's more than yeah. the reality. The reality. The reality is this, but I'm making it look like it's this. No, the reality is this, and he's only talking about that. Right, but I don't think we're, you're saying we're going like this. I think well, the author is saying something. <laughs> that's what the I'm author here to help. says it's purposeful <laughs> exaggeration. Yeah, I think if you read this book here too, along with it, you'd come out to where I am, and that is that there is there is a I want to express this difficulty because this is what I feel, and that, I think that let's just let's just land on that and not worry about wording on it because. When you're feeling like this, when you're feeling exasperated by life, you can fully feel confident in reading David and saying, God, this is exactly how I feel right now, which is what I'm trying to say about what Psalm 1 is trying to set us up for. Because expressing those things to God is internal healing when we do it. Right, and that's why I struggle with this statement because, yeah. you know, I've sure. suffered a lot in my life. Yeah. And so the Psalms help me. Amen. Yeah. Because, yep. you know, I see, okay, my emotions are not unacceptable. Right. Amen. But he's saying they're exaggerated in the Psalms. So yeah. then that makes me feel like when I struggle, my emotions are unacceptable. No. No, they're not. No, that, they're, they're acceptable. And you should you should read those those psalms and go, God, this is how I feel right now. 
and, and you need to know it because I am on high alert and my, I am triggered everywhere I turn. Everywhere I turn, I've got a trigger. Every, t every time I try to walk this way, I realize I got another hook holding on to me. I got to get, get, you know, Lord, help me take this out so I'm not hooked by that anymore. You know what I'm saying by that? It's like you're, you're, you're triggered and you're hooked and you don't even see it until you try to move somewhere and you're like, ah, I've been triggered. I'm, I need, to, I need to, to stop and tell you exactly how I feel so that you can help me come down from where I am. It's, it's therapeutic for sure. And it was, it was a part of me expressing like that to God how I felt. I didn't know it, but I, I didn't know you weren't supposed to do that as a good little Christian. You're not you're supposed to hide your feelings from God. But I was telling him exactly how I felt. And that's what led me to the Lord. Like moving from being a church person to a person who had a personal relationship with Christ. So I'm on board with you if that's what it's saying. I don't want any part of what the book is saying then, but but I don't want you to come away thinking that that, that was somehow wrong. Okay, well, I, I mean, maybe this week or whatever, you could reread the that last paragraph of, Psalm, of page one, 228. Okay. And see if you, what you think about it. Per perfectly acceptable uh, guidance, yes. The first part of that word was hyper. Yeah. And we are hypersensitive under certain circumstances. Yeah. If we look at the light directly, we're hypersensitive to the intensity of the light. And we have to announce that hypersensitive sensitivity to the circumstance that we're in at that point. Yeah. If we don't acknowledge the hyper part of hyperbole, we're going to suffer because of the suffocation. It's the epitome of hyperbole. Right. The epitome of hyperbole. Yes. I forgot my phone tonight, but I think it would be good to look up the actual Webster Dictionary definition of hyperbole because I think what he is getting at is the idea that it's a literary tool. It's not denying <coughs> anybody's emotion or any intensity of emotion. It's just a literary tool to be very intense. <coughs> and so it's, I know where you're going with the whole idea that it feels like BS, but I think that's not a true definition of hyperbole. <coughs> the definition's um, right here. <laughs> Exaggerated <laughs> statements or claims not meant to be taken literally. If it's another part to it that says to make a point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 so that says then that his emotions were not really that strong. Well, I think I think the na the narrative portions of First and Second Samuel would indicate that he did feel pretty intense there, like like he expresses in the Psalms. But he's using different definite. I mean, the Lord's leading him to use words to help us. I think ultimately to talk about these things as we read the Psalms and go, Lord, again, it's a guide for us when we're feeling like that. And it runs the gamut of emotions from, from anxiety to comfort to sadness to fear to um, all kinds of them. I mean, that's the, that's the beauty of the Psalms. So let me take, and I'm way, way over. <laughs> okay, real quick. Isn't that an example of that? It's what Jonah was feeling. Jonah said, none of the tree, I mean, under the plant, the worm comes up, eats it. God asked him, you know, are you angry about the plant? And Jonah's like, yes, I'm angry enough to die. You know? Yeah. Isn't that something of what we're talking about right now? I mean, did Jonah want to die? Yeah. Probably not, you know, but he was expressing his anger to God in such a way that he was trying to get, get across to him that, yeah, I, I'm, I feel really strongly about this situation, about yeah. this plan, and about you letting those guys off the hook. I, I think my mind goes to Elijah when he feels like he's the only one. <sighs> and he's like, he, he, he expresses, Lord, just make, make me no more on the earth. I'm not going to take my own life, but Lord, if you want to do that, I'm okay with that. Um, that's exasperation, and, and I, I mean, I think it's expressing a real thing, but it's it's just using language that's intense. But I, I don't think it's a misrepresentation of how David or Elijah or Jonah was feeling. I think that's where we're getting hung up on. Um, and I don't, I don't know that 
<coughs> we can't stay there. We don't have all night. So, so uh, I think that when we read the Psalms and we 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 uh, have to be careful about how we read them, the author starts rightly so, and that we misread Scripture. And the Psalms is one of those places. Um, the parallelism part of it, where you have two lines that are kind of saying the same thing, those those sort of uh, can trip us up where the author is using two lines to express one idea. Uh, that's one of those that I want to make particularly aware for you so that you don't try and take synonymous parallelism and make it like it's trying to say two different things. And there's some good examples in there uh, in the chapter about that. Um, I think that the uh, seven types of psalms that are listed, we should be careful and understand that that's not exhaustive. There are other kinds. This, this uh, How to Read the Psalms book goes into several other types of psalms. He sort of subdivides some of the larger terms that we get in How to Read the Bible for All to Earth. That's not negating what the, Bible, the book, our book that we're reading says. It just gets into finer detail. And this is one of those books right here, How to Read the Psalms, that's just really, it, it's, it's, you want this in your quiver <laughs> when you're talking about the Psalms, because it's, it's really rich. Who's the author? Uh, Tremper Longman, it's in our resources. I, I posted a link to it um, in, our, in our class. I, I can email the link out to everyone that believe that strongly in it. So. I'm going to let you go because it's quarter after, and I'm going to say uh, hit, hit, hang out in your groups until a quarter till, and then we'll come back together. Is that okay with you guys? All right. Spirited conversation. Wish I were better at it. You guys enjoy your time together. We'll come back here in a quarter till. Thanks. Okay. It is. 7.45. Any other questions? Based on your uh, group questions, any questions about that or comments to ponder? Yes, we want to ask you. Another unanswerable question? <laughs> no, but he asked, why do so many of the songs seem so angry? Yeah. We didn't feel that way. Intense? They're intense. Yeah, but um, we're angry. Well, uh, the, the, the imprecatory psalms, are, they're, they're pretty angry. And I, I think, um, I think there, there are more with that emotion in them than maybe you're thinking about. I don't know. Really? Yeah. I must see angry differently. Yeah. And I, I think that it's one of the things that anger does for me is there is there is definitely anger expressed at God, the angry and disappointment of God. Um, personally, that's one of those that I like. I can identify with that, and that it when I feel angry at God, and I read that there's a psalmist writer that's expressing those things. And that God is okay with me expressing that to Him, as if I could hide that from Him. It's kind of crazy when you think about it out loud, right? Like, he okay, knows. He knows. He knows. And yet, He still wants you to express it to Him. And I, actually, that's one of those. When, when I was a youth pastor, several students over the years would ask me, Tom, Pastor Tom, why does God want us to pray to Him when He knows I'm going to ask? What I'm going to ask already, why do I have to say it out, out to him? And I said, because you need the process, not God. Mm -hmm. And, and the, I would talk about when David is expressing his, his up, he's upset, he's angry with God, or Asaph, one of Asaph, or you know, his kids, or you know, one of his children's writing, and there's that expression of, of anger. It, God wants us to express that to him because he needs us to say that so that he can deal with it in our lives. Mm -hmm. I think when I was growing up, I felt, was taught, but maybe I just assumed that it was wrong to 
be angry with God. Right. That's yeah. That's why I, I spent, just changed my mind. That's exactly why I spent so much time talking about emotion and read that passage out of How to Read the Psalms by Long Trevor Longman. Because we don't have to protect God from us. He already knows it anyway. Exactly. And you know that that you're feeling a certain way. There is, there is something incredibly healthy about expressing that to God. And that he's designed us in a way that, that builds an intimacy with him. And you, you discover how broad his shoulders are. And, you know, no offense, but I grew up with the same feeling in the Douglas household. Like, if, 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 I'm, if I don't behave in a certain way, God's going to grease spot me. <laughs> you know? and that, it worked, didn't it? Yeah. No, I, I mentioned the therapy. I mentioned that therapy is a good thing. It's very powerful. Do not hesitate away from therapy because it's really good and recovery. If we can express our anger to God about the injustice that we see, yes, child trafficking, uh, injustice within our family, murder in the city of Rockford, if we yeah, right. I, I think that it, it's important for us to see ourselves as many faceted, and when one part of us is not healthy, it affects other parts of us, for sure. And that's spiritually healthy, emotionally healthy. I think I said that early on that an absolute scriptural... Uh, one of the truths that scripture reveals is that the level of our, our emotional health is the limiter to how much our spiritual health can grow. Mm -hmm. Like, so if you're emotionally unhealthy and unstable, it's going to limit how deeply you can, you can run with the Lord and how much you can have your feet underneath you emotionally, spiritually. Uh, it just, it's, it's all through scripture. And, and I, I'm trying to say yes in the same way you are. The first verse of the a back, back that we studied on Sunday, the very first one. Yeah. Law. Yes. Yes. And I mean, our chapter deals with lament. It's the biggest chunk of the Psalms is lament. And, you know, um, many have said that the blues is just a good man feeling bad. <laughs> I like the blues. It, it, it kind of expresses things in a way that your, your heart's feeling and it just... You listen to it, you're going, yes, exactly that, right there. That's how I feel when I read the Psalms, especially the Lament Psalms. It's like, yes, God, I'm reading. That's exactly how I feel right now. They just, they did it better, and they did it more poetically, and it's, I feel it deeply, and I feel that coming from my spiritual toes to tell you about it in a way that connects you to a God who, who has, isn't it incredible to be able to think, God put that in there because he wanted you to be able to express that to you. How long, O Lord? And he, he's, um, the Hebrew in, in Habakkuk is, it's pretty intense. <clears throat> like the, word, the words that he's using in there, like violence, he uses violence twice in four verses. Did you notice that? Yeah. It shows up, the word violence in, in Hebrew is Hamas. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, used twice there to for him to express to God what he's seeing. And it's a direct result of two things that are going on in the society. A lack of righteousness, and, and there is no justice to be found. And isn't it interesting that we see violence everywhere we turn? And does it not seem that there's a, a tremendous lack of righteousness? And justice seems to be turned on its head. That's what that's what Habakkuk is saying there. And, uh, you know, I thought when we, we did prophecy and the, the prophets the week before, you know, just a couple of days before we uh, dealt with it in church, it was just incredible timing, I thought. And I was, I was proud that we were a part of that, ahead of that, and you were just, you guys were going to be all over it, you know, as Pastor Dave was preaching on it. Um, I, I just really enjoyed it a lot. So... But that, that is absolutely true of the Psalms as well. 
Like we can find that same sentiment, how long, O oh Lord, multiple times in the Lament of Psalms. Mm -hmm. And to complain to him, like, God, are you not paying attention here? You know, that's so powerful. And then, God, if you, you need to wait and listen and read scripture and let the Holy Spirit speak to you, and then before you know it, he's going, yep, I got it. I'm with you. You're right. <laughs> Take the long view. <laughs> so, other questions about the, the chapter? Questions on the, the discussion, the chapter questions out of the handout? Except for Dave. <laughs> so, I'd like to finish with the three um, benefits and the one caution. I, I want to land there because I think that it's absolutely worth visiting the hermeneutical observations the three basic benefits of the Psalms, because it's going to reiterate what I was trying to say in the first half of our teaching. Number one benefit, it can serve as a guide for worship. Like, you don't need, you don't need any, anybody to put together a worship service for you. You have it in the Psalms. Mm -hmm. Not that it's bad. Don't hear me what I'm not saying. But I'm saying if you're on your own somewhere and, and you God has taken you out into the woods to do business with him and you have your Bible with you or you have some psalms memorized, you can have a worship service right then and there. And they were meant to be sung. Isn't that cool when you read about that, that the psalms were meant to be sung? especially for those of us who only make a joyful noise. <laughs> My hand is way up in the air on that one, right? Yeah. And that they were, they were sung in the midst of uh, the usage of Israel. The Psalms were sung in their midst to, to celebrate or express community difficulty, uh, to um, to say yay God when he had done something in their midst that those were all the songs were used for all of those things and we rightly so should continue to use them in the midst of our worship because it's timeless it is not limited to um, a location and time like historical books or some of the other sections of our book, you know? The Psalms are timeless in their writing and in their nature. Um, secondly, uh, is the one that it helps us to demonstrate, it demonstrate to us how we can relate honestly to God. How we can relate honestly to God. That's, that's ultimately what I've been talking about the whole time. And I think that as, as a church, or as people of God, if we can live that, we'll be deeper Christians as a result. We, we, God will run deeper in our souls as a result. That, that we don't have this concept that we can't be angry with God, or we can't think that he shortchanged us and we're getting ripped off by God, or, or that that we were, you know, getting the short end of the stick in life. It's authentic and connected to the reality that you're living. That that's the kind of faith I want. Because if my truth that I'm living isn't big enough for the experiences that I have, then I don't want it. I have to live according to a truth that's bigger than the circumstances of my life. And that's what the Psalms helps us live. This truth that we profess is deeper and bigger and more solid than the circumstances that I come in contact with in my life, no matter what it is. No matter what it is. Even to the point where the Son of the living God is dying on the cross. God's truth is bigger than that circumstance. Because he didn't stay down in that grave forever. It wasn't three days, by the way, but it was <laughs> counting of three days. It's Friday and Saturday and Sunday. That thirdly demonstrates the importance of reflection and meditation on that which God has done for us. Recounting, 
reminding ourselves, rehearsing what God has done. When we are at our wit's end, when we are full of anxiety, when we are shouting at God saying, where are you? I need you right now. Time and again, you see in the Psalms that whoever's writing a particular Psalm, they're rehearsing all the things that God has done in their past. God, I know you're going you're gonna to work and act on my behalf because you've done it here, and you've done it here, and you've done it here, and I'm drawing breath right now, and I lived through all of that incredible nonsense in my life, and here I am still professing my faith in you, so show up and show off right now. Huge benefit. And then I want to land on that whole thing that the um, Psalms do not guarantee a pleasant life. No prosperity gospel allowed. That's my eternal now. The name it and claim it folks that I have that I don't I don't get how they do that, but okay. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I think that if you can become even more familiar with the Psalms, you know, read read in the, in the various books of the Psalms, the five books of the Psalms. Use the types of Psalms that are book listed, and he gives, you know, some of the Psalms that are, you know, within whichever type there is. Some really cool, so the Royal Psalms. Have you ever visited those and thought of them that way? Pretty amazing. So use that as a guide for your worship. And uh, I will close us in prayer, and then we're going to meet next week, and we're going to discuss wisdom literature. Is that cool? No, no guarantee. <coughs> How many more weeks? We have about three weeks left after this one. So there's chapter 12, chapter 13, and then there's the appendix, which will just kind of wrap up on week 14. So it, hopefully it doesn't seem like it's been too long, but let me close this in prayer. Lord, I, I thank you that your word is available to us that we can read it. I thank you that it changes us from the inside out. Thank you for the book of Psalms and how much it means to every one of us. I'm so thankful for it. Sometimes I am surprised by your word and the Psalms definitely surprise me as to what they say and the subjects that they deal with. Thanks so much for this time today, Lord, and our opportunity to be together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.